So in studying cellular reproduction, we need to focus first on what has to happen with the DNA in order for a cell to reproduce and make sure that both new cells being made have the exact amount of DNA that's required. So DNA is usually found in the or inside the nucleus in the form of chromosomes. And chromosomes are what we would consider the coiled, organized form of DNA. So over here is a chromosome. That's a condensed chromosome. Everything is coiled up and wound up. So we see that only in dividing cells, okay? Only when the cell is reproducing can you actually see chromosomes. Now, in eukaryotic cells, the reason the chromosomes can condense and, and form that X-like looking structure is because there are histones, which are proteins that maintain shape and aid in packing DNA. So when you glance at the previous picture, this is showing the coiling that occurs of the DNA around different proteins. So right here, the blue and the bright green are called histones. They enable that DNA strand to wind up and wrap around what we call non-histones, which are proteins then that control the um, activity of the DNA. So the non-histones are these white pieces of protein that have the DNA and histones wound all the way around it. So that's what we call um, supercoiling. So if chromosomes are only found in dividing cells, in eukaryotic cells, what forms the DNA in when the cell's not dividing? Well, that's what we call chromatin right here. And chromatin is listed underneath where it says chromosomes consist of in your note packet. There's a star next to it, okay? Um, but chromatin is the uncoiled version of the DNA. It kind of looks like a bunch of string just kind of thrown into the nucleus. There's no rhyme or reason and, uh, in, inside there. So imagine having that DNA double so that way the cell could split. Oh, that's a lot of DNA. So when we look specifically at the structure of a chromosome, the chromosomes consist of two basic parts. The chromatid, which is either of the two identical halves of the chromosome, and the centromere, the point at which the sister chromatids are actually attached. So here's where we get to write down chromatin. Remember, chromatin is the uncoiled, unorganized DNA found in non-dividing cells. So that would be our definition for chromatin. So <clears throat> once you've got that written down, I want you to take a look at this diagram over here. Because chromosomes, okay, are these long arms, right? And they're made out of two identical halves because you can see way down here at the bottom it says unduplicated. And this is an unduplicated piece of, of DNA. But before the cell can divide, it has to create another copy. So our next unit after exams, or after this really, is going to be um, how that DNA actually is structured and works and how it reproduces itself. Now, the two sister chromatids <coughs> are, which is the duplicated DNA, the identical arms, is held together by a piece of protein, kind of like a paper clip or a rubber band, kind of holds these two pieces together. We can tell usually where that centromere is located because the arms are pinched together. So notice how that it's not like this is an arm and this is an arm. It's more that the two arms are laying next to each other and they're almost pinched together by that centromere. Now, in prokaryotic cells, the DNA is in a little bit different kind of a situation. In prokaryotic cells, there is no nucleus. So there's only one chromosome attached to the inside of the cell membrane. Its shape is circular. It doesn't form that X-like shape like the chromosomes in eukaryotic cells. So each species has a characteristic number of chromosomes in its body cells. So for example, humans have 46 chromosomes in each body cell. 
So all of your muscle cells, your blood cells, your bone cells, your nerve cells, all have 46 chromosomes. But what I want you to think about is just because an organism has a lot of chromosomes, does that necessarily mean that the organism is complex? So I'm going to switch the screen and we're going to take a look at a diagram or a chart that identifies it lists different species of organisms and how many chromosomes are actually present. So looking at the numbers of pairs of chromosomes in these different species of plants and animals, just take a look at some of them. Mosquitoes, three pairs of chromosomes. Okay. A housefly, six pairs. Hmm. Well, they're both insects. That sounds reasonable. Toad, 11. Rice, a rice plant, is 12. A frog has 13 pairs. Look at the monkey. The monkey has 21 pairs. Humans, we have 23 pairs. Huh. But check this out. The carp has 52 pairs. They've got 104 total chromosomes in every single body cell. That's incredible. So the question is, is does the chromosome number actually equal complexity? Hmm. I'd say no. I'd say that the chromosome number does not equal the complexity of the organism. So go ahead and fill in that blank does not equal complexity, okay? It's not written in your note packet, but you can go ahead and, and jot that down because that's something you're going to want to remember. That's pretty important. So in humans, um, humans and animal chromosomes are actually categorized, and they're categorized based upon what kind of cells they're found in. Um, I'm sorry, not what kind of cells they're found in, but what, what the chromosomes are actually for. So in sexual organisms, there's going to be a pair of sex chromosomes. And these are the chromosomes that determine the gender of the individual. Autosomes are all of the other chromosomes that affect all of the other traits. So sexual reproduction, especially in humans and other higher organisms, um, involves homologous chromosomes. Now we've studied that prefix before, homo meaning the same, so homologous chromosomes are two members of a chromosome pair. They are the same size, the same shape, and they code for the exact same traits. So when we look at these homologous chromosomes, you can tell that these two go together <coughs> because they're the same size and also because they have the same um, centromere location. Look at these two. They've got the same banding patterns, they've got the same centromere location, and they're the same size. Now, because we know that these homologous pairs match, it makes it easy for us to utilize this information. So when we study a person's chromosomes, we can study their chromosomes using um, what's called a karyotype. Um, and a karyotype is, is basically um, a, a procedure used to view a person's chromosomes. Now, of course, you have to be able to get cells that are dividing in order to see them. So if we were to take a blood sample um, and we were to look for white blood cells that were actively reproducing, we would be able to extract or pull out or take pictures of those chromosomes. So we have the, the technology to be able to do that, but then um, a technologist would have to sit down and literally pull all of those chromosomes out because you can see over here in this cell, the chromosomes aren't like organized by pairs. The homologous pairs aren't actually next to each other when you look in that nucleus. So the end product is called a karyotype. It is a chart that displays the chromosomes for a person or for, a, for an organism. Okay, so you can see that there's 22 pairs of autosomes and there is one pair of sex chromosomes down in the bottom corner. So we're going to take a look at some of those um, in just a minute. Now, there is um, what is called the chromosome number of the cell that we have to focus on. 
when we look at a cell, we are either going to see a diploid number or a haploid number. Now the diploid number is a cell that contains both chromosomes of each homologous pair. It's a full set of the chromosomes, meaning they received one from mom and one from dad through sexual reproduction, one from the egg, one from the sperm. That gives you your normal diploid number. All of your body cells contain the diploid number. Now again, for humans, that diploid number is 46. Okay, don't forget that. That's something you need to remember. The haploid number is a cell that is going to be, a, or an example is going to be a cell that contains only one chromosome of each homologous pair. So that's only the sperm or the egg. It's the reproductive cells in a sexually reproducing organism. So we would display that, we would identify that as saying just N or 1N as opposed to 2N. So this means that there's only one chromosome of each homologous pair present. It might be the maternal chromosome or it might be the paternal chromosome. For example, if I'm looking up here at this diploid cell, I'm indicating that this is the dad chromosome and this is the mom chromosome, okay? But in the sperm, sorry, in the sperm or the egg, you might only get the mom chromosome, okay? But then the purple one might be a dad chromosome. Do you follow me? All right, so exactly what does that mean for us? Well, when we look at the karyotype, Okay, this is a normal human karyotype, and we're going to have the opportunity to do this in class. So the goal is to match up those homologous chromosomes. So we can see here this dashed line is indicating the centromere position. Okay, I can see chromosome set number one, two, three, four, five, etc., all the way down to chromosome set number 22. Notice how they start large and get smaller. The last two that are going to be on the karyotype form are those sex chromosomes. Now if someone inherits the X chromosome and a Y chromosome, do you know what that makes them, what gender that they are? Hopefully you responded with male. Now here are some other um, karyotype forms that show variations, differences. Okay, This individual has Klinefelter syndrome. Do you see where the issue is? Everyone should have only a single pair of chromosomes. So do you see right here in chromosome number 21? There are three instead of only two. That means this individual has Down syndrome. Over here, this person inherited an X, an X, and a Y. Huh. Well, that's 47 chromosomes total. So this individual has Klinefelter syndrome. Okay. Here is a normal female karyotype. You can see that there are two X's and no Y's. And over here is the normal male karyotype. Some information that you might find useful is looking at your chromosomes while you're doing your karyotype lab and looking for where is the centromere location. Is it metacentric, right in the middle? Is it submetacentric? where it's kind of halfway between the middle and the tips. Acrocentric is going to be even closer to the ends, and telocentric is when the centromere is literally located right at the tip of the chromosome pair. Good, that's where we're going to stop for now.